Bill, thanks for doing this again. We appreciate it. Sure. Let's kind of start. This is kind of a <coughs> chronological thing, so we'll, we'll start at the beginning. I understand you grew up in the Detroit area. Right. And uh, what was your early, in did you have an early interest in the sciences? Um, well, in, once I got into high school, I did, I guess, but not before that. I mean, uh, nowadays, kids want to grow up to be paleontologists, but back in the 50s living in Detroit, you know, that wasn't it. That wasn't what you were thinking about. You were, you were looking at all the new cars with the big fins that came out every year, and that was kind of the focus until you got into more serious mode as you get older. So. When did when did uh, when did you get the bug for it? Not until I was in grad school, actually. I, I got a, a bachelor's in in zoology and a master's in zoology, and then I took some classes in paleontology as part of that zoology sequence. So then I got into it as a PhD student. So I, I think I heard you say uh, in one of your the recordings I saw that you're. Uh, Primarily a, bio, primarily a biologist first, and the geology thing kind of came along right, afterwards. Right, right. Um, so you did all three degrees at Wayne State, is that right? Right. Okay. Um, so in graduate school, how, how did your interest in paleontology start to evolve? Well, <clears throat> I took some classes from a paleontologist at Wayne State on my master's, when I was taking my master's degree, as I said before, John Cosgrove. And he got me interested in doing a PhD, and I originally wasn't going to do it at Wayne State. He, I was going to go off to California, Berkeley, which is where he was from, on his recommendation. And then he got this Antarctic project kind of put in his lap. By a, a, The first fossils were found in Antarctica, not until like 1969, 70. And so the first expeditions looking for these kinds of fossils weren't until the early 70s. And they were run by a guy named Ned Colbert, who was kind of the, you know, granddaddy of paleontology in, in this country back in the, in the, at that time. But when he started running his expeditions in, in the early 70s, he was already retired in his late 60s. So after a couple of those expeditions, he decided he didn't want anything to do with it anymore. And he was a colleague of John Cosgrove's because they had worked on similar kinds of things. <clears throat> and so he offered to let John take it over. And so then when John needed a student, he didn't have one that he, at the time, that he thought he wanted to give this big a project to. So he said, well, if you want to go to Antarctica. I said, when you're 27, you go to Antarctica. You're not, you're not worried about the prestige of Berkeley at, quite yet. yet. Maybe that comes later, but uh, in the end it didn't matter. So. Was this what 1977? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, 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 when you think about, when you think about dinosaurs and Antarctica, it's kind of counterintuitive to the to the layperson, right. but not not so much for somebody who's you know under you know understands uh, the global drift of the planets and, or not the planets but the continents and everything. Right. Could you take us a little inside that uh, because. Uh, Antarctica wasn't always cold. No, no. In, in fact, just to take the story from the beginning before I get into that, when we were going down there in the 70s, we weren't finding dinosaurs either. We were finding these animals called synapsids, which are sort of a cross between, halfway between a reptile and becoming a mammal. And uh, the first finding of these synapsids in Antarctica happened right when the theory of plate tectonics was catching on in the early 70s, and we had physical evidence for the continents moving, and now we have biological evidence that we couldn't have these animals living in Antarctica, and they're the same kinds of animals as were living on the other southern continents. So at Antarctica at the time was actually part of a, a supercontinent called Gondwana, which included South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia, and India. India wasn't always in the north. It broke away and rammed into Asia. And it was so, it was at higher latitude. It was still, or lower latitude. It was still fairly high latitude. Um, and, and the latitude it was at today would not be amenable to dinosaurs and have the same kind of climate. But we didn't have any ice caps back then. And climates were, were milder at higher latitudes. What was the place, what was the place <coughs> like in terms of its uh, 
you know, uh, environment, uh, the, the temperature? What, 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 what can we make an educated guess at? That it was well, it, it wasn't tropical, but it wasn't uh, seasonally real cold. So the best way to think of it is like the northwest coast of the United States, which, you know, San Francisco is at pretty high, as high a latitude as Chicago, but it doesn't have the seasonality. And this was fairly close to what was a coast at that time where these things are found. In terms of their, uh, um, uh, their background, uh, these are Mesozoic vertebrates? Is that right. Okay. The first ones we were finding were <clears throat> from the early part of the, what's called the Triassic period. They were about 250 million years old. Then we started finding some that were about 230 million years old, but still too old to be dinosaurs. And then in the 90s, we started finding dinosaurs, which are about 190 to 200 million years old. And when you actually, uh, the, the, the animal that, uh, the first one you found, that was the dinosaur, uh, and I'm not going to try to attempt the, the name. I've tried it a couple of times, and I'll just embarrass myself. Cryolophosaurus. I, I was close. Cryolophosaurus. Right. Uh, where did you where did you find the first first evidence of this creature? Actually, um, it was in a piece of the, the mountain ranges in Antarctica where we work. Um, the peaks go up to fifteen thousand feet. And the ice level is about seven or eight thousand, so you're working in the top parts of the peaks. But back when we had ice ages here, the, that ice was actually much thicker, and, and that whole mountain range was under ice. And what ice does is it erodes things and pulls off big chunks. It doesn't erode it like like rain does. It just breaks off big chunks and moves them around. And we found a, a, another geologist, a friend of mine, who was working at near that site but working on volcanic rocks, uh, found some scree, which is just loose, bro broken rock that had been left behind by these glaciers. And he called me and he said, well, I think there's something in this, looks like bone. Because he had been on some of the earlier expeditions where we'd found bones. And so we went over there and sure enough, so we just had to figure out, look around on that mountain to see where it might've come from. And then once we, well, it was easy. Once we found it, there was a three foot long femur sticking out of the side of the mountain. Pretty easy to see. <laughs> talk, talk about your aha moments. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what what were you able to find out? Uh, it was was this thing, uh, did it die in some kind of um, uh, creek bed or? It died adjacent to a river and, and was buried over by floodplain deposits, river deposits, which is where we find most dinosaurs in some kind of fluvial or river type environment. Had other carnivores worked it over, could you tell? Uh, yeah, there were, we found some little broken scavenger teeth and, and some of the, and it was disarticulated. It was all in one general area, but it wasn't still put together as a skeleton. There was a bone here or there, they'd been moved around. Mm -hmm. Some parts of it were articulated, parts that don't have much meat on it, like the head still had the jaws attached. Parts of the tail were still intact, like vertebra all in a row. Is this, is this an early, is this like a, a great grandfather of T-Rex? Uh, sort of, same group. Uh -huh. Yeah, much older. T-Rex is actually closer to, to, to right now than it is to this dinosaur. T-Rex was about 70 million years ago, and this is 120 million years before that. Uh -huh. But it's so about half the size of T-Rex. If he's half the size of T-Rex, and we're going to see the uh, skeleton upstairs or the, the mock-up of that, uh, describe him for the for the viewer in terms of how long how how long he is, how tall he is, how much he might weigh. Um, well, it's it's about twenty-two feet long, and it's a bipedal, stands on two legs with short arms like T-Rex, and a very big head with with sharp teeth. Uh, and and if at the hip level, I mean it depends how tall it is depends on how it's standing, but if it's level at the highest point at the hips is probably about uh, seven or eight feet off the ground. Was he pretty much a predator or a scavenger? Yeah. No, pro probably a predator. Uh, uh, it's pretty uh, pretty fearsome looking creature when you when you get a look at the head. It, you, I got to imagine there's several tons of foot. Uh, pressure he could put on. Yeah, he probably weighed about a ton, ton and a half. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it wasn't real heavy because these bipedal things were kind of fast and built for speed, even though they were big. And and you know, to put it in context, this is this is the first vertebrate dinosaur that was found there. Right. What kind of sensation or what kind of uh, significance did this have in, in, in your world and in, in, in the science that you work in as far as finding one of these down there for the first time in Antarctica? Well, it, uh, because we were finding these older things before that, we, we surmised that it was likely dinosaurs lived there, but we didn't have evidence of it. Mm -hmm. and, and then we found this thing, and, and so that was, that was a start. The other interesting thing about it is its age, because its dinosaurs started about 220 million years ago, and they became extinct 65 million years ago. But about 75 or 80 percent of the dinosaurs that we found and we know a lot about are right from the end of their ex age, time of existence. We don't have very much evidence from the beginning from anywhere in the world. So this was unusual because it was a, a, such a complete dinosaur and so large a dinosaur from that age. It's the largest carnivore in the world from that point in time. And it's very unique, kind of holds a, a, an interesting position between r more primitive carnivores that were around right at the dawn of dinosaurs and then the ones that come later like Allosaurus and, and eventually Tyrannosaurus. Um, have, have similar discoveries taken place around the world? Has this animal been found other places? No. Not yet. Uh, anything from his era yet? Yes. Yeah, there are other okay. things from that age. Uh -huh. uh, but none of them are terribly closely related to this thing. Because mm -hmm. uh, most of the other dinosaurs of that age, not all, but most of them are not from southern continents. They're actually from the northern continents. So they were qu geographically quite, quite far away from where this dinosaur lived. Now, do we know, was this a male or a female? Uh, we don't know. We only have one. <laughs> uh, you're it does have a display crest, and we do know there's sexual dimorphism in some dinosaurs. But so you could you could hypothesize that maybe it was a male because maybe they had display features, because we see that in some other dinosaurs where we have evidence because we have a lot of specimens, and so we can see half of them look like this and half look like that. And so these must be males. These must be females. But when you only have one, it's kind of tough. Now, now, your friend, uh, the artist, uh, Bill Stout, uh, how did he come up with his, uh, his ideas of what this, this thing might have looked like in real life? Well, he, he's, he, before he got around to drawing, painting these things, he had had quite a bit of experience painting other kinds of dinosaurs and animals. And the way Bill works is, at least he works with me, is he would, he would look at the skeletal structure and then he would make a mock-up of what he thought it looked like. And then he would always send me things for correction. And, you know, should I make it fatter? Or should I do this, that, the other thing, you know, blah, blah, blah. So he kind of does it through consultation and, and he's A little pretty artistic good at, license. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some of that in there, yeah. too. Um, so you've made how many trips to this site? Is it eight or nine? Oh, I made eight trips to Antarctica total. Uh -huh. But to this site, uh, let me see, we made three trips to the, the site where Cryolophosaurus is from. Is it still an active dig for, for you and your colleagues? Uh, it took us three seasons, but we finished that quarry. There might be other things on that same mountain, but the quarry where, the original quarry we had, we finished. And then we, we did find, after we finished the quarry, we did find some more stuff. In, in, more isolated nearby. So actually we have, the last time we were in Antarctica we found two more new dinosaurs that we hadn't found before. Mm. So we were, and those are what we're working on now. Um, describe the, the difficulty of working where you were. I understand it's about 13,000 feet up so oxygen is scarce and it's colder than I'll get out. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> in the summer it's 25 to 30 plus 25 to 35 below zero Fahrenheit, and uh, it, yeah, so it's it's exhausting to work because not only the cold but but the altitude. Mm -hmm. uh, but we we kind of get used to it. The only time it's really bad is if it's windy, 
And then when it's really windy at those temperatures, it's really hard to get anything done. Did you have a crew of uh, uh, students from here and other uh, universities with you, <coughs> grad students? Um, I, I, different seasons, I've de different crews, mm -hmm. different numbers. Um, the smallest group I ever went down with was, was like four of us. The biggest was the last trip. There were ten of us. Uh, and sometimes I've taken undergraduates. More often I've taken students who are former undergraduates here who are now in graduate school in paleontology because they got interested through me. So, um, and then I also take other colleagues. Uh, the last trip I had, uh, I had a former student uh, who's actually going to take over the project. He finished his PhD at the University of Chicago. He's got a full-time faculty position at Howard. Mm -hmm. And so we've got another proposal in for another field season, but I put him as the lead PI on this mm -hmm. so that he can, I've been there, I've, I've, I'll probably, he, I'll go back with him, but it's, it's time to pass the ball, as you will, or however you want to put it. Like, like it was to me for my advisor, you know, mm -hmm. it's time for somebody else to move in and he's well trained. That's kind of a culture that's the way the thing works. But, uh, but, but I had a colleague from the Field Museum with me as well, because I'm, I'm a research associate at the Field Museum, so I have a close association with them. That's where the original dinosaur specimens are going to end up, because mm -hmm. they're type specimens. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there, there were a variety of people, mm -hmm. including we take a professional mountaineer mm -hmm. to keep us out of trouble. You know, when, when you think about Antarctica, what is it? <laughs> 98, you can own 98 percent of it's covered up by ice and stuff. You're only really working in very marginal right. areas. Do you ever sit back and wonder? Well, I wonder what else is there because we sure. just can't get there. <laughs> we can't. We, we have no idea. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know the. I believe I saw, heard something on NPR. I think it was last year where the Russians have actually done some drilling down in and they found freshwater lakes like a right. mile down. Yeah, under Vostok Station. Actually, more than a mile. Yeah, that's the, the water's not frozen because of the pressure. Wow, I wonder what they're finding. <laughs> that's got to be fascinating. Um, so, uh, where where do you? Uh, how do you feel uh, in terms of what kind of satisfaction, professional satisfaction, do you take from, you know, having uh, having a dinosaur named after you, having uh, having this significant finding in your in your uh, scholarly work? Well, it's it's kind of uh, it's great. I mean, you know, I it's it's kind of like I mentioned in in my speech at the ceremony. I said, you know, it, it takes a lot of hard work, but it also takes some luck, um, especially in this kind of field, because you never know what you're going to find. But um, uh, I've been very fortunate. So, what's what's next on the horizon for you? What uh where, where does the research take you now? Well, we're still working on stuff from two years ago. Uh, we just got another grant from the National Science Foundation for two, two more years of funding. Not, not to go back in the field, but just to see this slab of rock behind me, just to finish getting all the bones out of these big slabs of rock that we brought back. We bring back seven or 800 pound slabs and they're full of bones. So it takes a while to, because we have to, chisel away mechanically at it. There's no, no it, the rock is very hard silicate material and so we can't dissolve it away or anything. Mm -hmm. And I actually have a, a guy, a, a person, a paleontologist with a master's degree who works full time for me on this project in this lab uh, getting the bones out of the rock. Plus I have a couple of student interns. And they're not here right now because they're out in the field collecting dinosaurs in Montana. Actually, I think they might be coming home this week. I, 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 think, I think they're due, due back. Maybe they're due back today. I don't remember. I lost track. But they're, they're on another dig with the Burpee Museum in hmm. Rockford. And, and I, I do that to give my students experience. Um, It'd be, it's very valuable field experience, the ones that want to go on and be paleontologists. And then I send Josh, who works for me along with him, to keep track of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to go myself. 
Um, you've been at Augustana since what, 1981, is that right? Right. Uh, I, I think it's just fascinating that a, a small uh, institution like this has such a world-renowned reputation. Uh, they, they seem to be very supportive of your work. Uh, could you describe uh, how this fits into the overall mission of teaching, research, and service for this you know, this college? Um, well, it's it, it it does. It it's it's kind of. Uh, unusual at a school like this to have this big a research project but these, this kind of stuff this kind of research on some scale is quite common at schools like this because they're um, our goal is a liberal arts education but also to prepare students for further education if they're interested in it and, and so that's where you got you have to go beyond the classroom and get them involved in hands-on things and original kinds of work and I've just been fortunate enough to have this monstrous kind of project rather than something on a smaller scale. So, uh, but anyway, the college has been has been supportive all the time. And, and as a, as a teacher and a researcher, what do you get out of watching the young people dig into this stuff and start to make their own discoveries and the light bulbs come on in their heads? Yeah, right. I've got several of those that. Or the, the one taking over this project, but I've got several other ones who are finishing up PhDs in paleontology, and some of, some of whom have designs to come and take my job when I retire. <laughs> I said, "Well, it's not going to be for a while, uh, several years at least, but they're, they're they're not quite done anyway." So it's funny, and I see them at meetings, and they get to I take them out to lunch, and they get together, and they argue over which one of them. Is going to get my job. And <laughs> I said, well, you know, we'll see. Yeah, I have that in radio TV too. <laughs> yeah. What's interesting is the, is the students that you had back in the early 80s, you know, who come back now with kids to go yeah. to school and all of a sudden grandkids, and I'm just going, oh my God, how did this happen? Yeah. Uh, now, as I understand it, there's a Mount Augustana in Antarctica. Could you, right. could you tell me the story about that? How'd that happen? Um, yeah, actually, there's something named after me uh, on Glacial Ridge, uh, Hammer Call, which happened uh, several years ago, and I can't explain where that came from. What happens is somebody nominates a feature that isn't named, you make a nomination to the, this, there's a national board on geographic names. And once they look at it, it, first of all, it has to be something that isn't already been named and they have records of that. Secondly, the name has to have some kind of significance. You can't just say, oh, I want to name it after my kid, you know. Uh, it has to have some kind of meaning to the place. So I don't know who nominated this, this glacial ridge to be named after me. I can't figure that out. but. I do know what happened with Mount Augustana. A year after that, um, I discovered that some friends of mine, colleagues of mine uh, from Ohio State University, uh, made that nomination. Because Mount Augustana is uh, the highest peak in the area that I first went to when I was a graduate student. And I have been back there again. I've been there twice, first as a graduate student again in the 90s. And some of the geologists from Ohio State, Ohio State has this big bird polar research center. So they have a concentration of scientists that work in Antarctica and the Arctic. And a couple of close colleagues from, from, uh, from the bird polar center admitted that they nominated that peak to be named Mount Augustana. So, so Augustana has made a mark in a couple of different ways on the, the continent there. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. I want to... Uh, I, I, just remember now reading about a center for polar research here at Augustana. Right. Tell me about that, because uh, it's working at both ends of the world. Well, <clears throat> yeah, that uh, that was the president President Ball's idea several years ago. President the President Ball's and the former dean uh, got this idea because I had been here working on this project for a long time, but back about seven or eight years ago, um, we hired a geographer who, she's actually a, got a PhD in geology, she works on Arctic soils, mm -hmm. on high latitude soils. And, and the, so we hired this geographer and she's, she and her husband 
have a research project going in Greenland. And every summer, one or the, sometimes both of them or one or the other of them will be up in Greenland working on this research project. And so the administration here got this idea that this, it's kind of odd that we've had hammer all these years and now we've got somebody working, doing research in the Arctic and the Antarctic at this little place, so we established a center. And it's, it's not a thing that's extremely active, but we have a board that includes half of the people on cam are on campus and half are colleagues off campus. And we, we have a budget, so we sponsor, uh, mainly we sponsor lectures we sponsor student research in the summer. Um, a lot of my students I fund through my NSF grant, but Jenny's students that she takes to Greenland, she doesn't have that same kind of support. So we'll support one of her students to go on one of her Greenland expeditions. Um, and we even sponsor family things, like we had a polar palooza a while back, with, you know, for bring kids and learn about the things that happening at the poles. That's pretty good. Um, I always ask a, a question toward the end about uh, the uh, your reaction to winning the Lincoln uh, uh, medallion. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of a singular thing for a, a, for a state to do for for notable citizens. It what is. was your reaction when you found out that you you'd won this? I, 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 I at first I wasn't sure what it was. You know what I mean? I said, and then I'm reading about it. I'm going, really. And so I, I actually I ended up I, I I was very pleased when I found out what it meant, but I I had to eventually go to the president of the college to see what was going on because I was reading about it and we were going to host it here too. And I said, "So Steve, what do you know about this?" He goes, "What do you mean?" I said, "I got this thing and I just came in the mail one day, you know, FedEx." And and he goes, "Did you actually get that award?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "Oh." He said, oh, well, I nominated you, but I didn't know, I didn't know what it took to get it. So I said, well, it worked. You're an excellent company. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yes. One, one final question as I kind of wrap up here. Um, you know, you, you've had a, a terrific academic career. You've made some important discoveries. For you personally, what's the most satisfying thing about what you've been able to do in, in your line of work? Well, I, I think to me the most satisfying thing at this stage anyway, maybe it wasn't that way 20 years ago, but uh, at this stage is to see the success that I've been able to let my students in on and see see their, see their see that they're reaching a lot of their goals and, and, and a lot of that's because of my help and my influence. And so it's really the influence I've had on them probably that at this point is means the most to me. But I, it's not bad having dinosaurs as your legacy. They're the first one from Antarctica, so.